Improving your site, making it faster, will actually um, you know, have a, an impact on your bottom line. Having a fast site means that uh, Google is going to send more traffic to your site. And making sure that it's fast means that they'll probably stay longer. Uh, so there's a direct relationship between how slow a site is and the likelihood for people to just leave. So at the end of the day, whatever it is that you're trying to uh, use your site for to, to have a positive impact on your bottom line, making your site faster is going to make it more effective in doing that. So there are a variety of potential factors in terms of um, you know, things that can make your site slow or fast, and we'll talk about all of those in turn. But let's dive into this surgical approach that we're here to talk about. So we're going to start by running some tests to gather data. We're going to use that to formulate a diagnosis, figure out the things that we need to actually go in and change. We're going to make those changes and then uh, make sure that we don't sort of relapse over time and, and end up back at where we started. So let's begin with the testing. Really we have three goals in terms of what we're trying to do. So to start, we want to understand what can or can't be changed within our site. We want to figure out which pages within our site are the ones that we really need to focus on. And then within those pages, what are the specific elements that we need to go in and, and uh, make better? So the first part of that is really having the conversation. Sometimes it's with an external client. Maybe it's a, a business owner within your own company around what really are the requirements and what things end up in the site just because they're sort of window dressing or nice to have or the new hotness. Um, really, as we talked about before, things that, that may make the site slightly sexier but actually uh, degrade the performance are actually costing the business money. A lot of times clients want a carousel. Um, if you're having that conversation with the client and can't get them to budge, uh, you might show them this site, should I use a carousel? If you has, haven't visited, I'll give you a spoiler, the answer is no. Uh, there's lots of great UX data in here that really shows that they're, they're really not effective and just add to the bloat of the site. And here's a site that's been attributed to DaVinci. It's also something that Steve Jobs uh, took as sort of a core philosophy. Um, and I think it's really important uh, when we're having those conversations around um, not only the, the content, but the features of the site. Really try and keep it pared down to those things that significantly add to the user experience and, and help them with the, the things that they need or that as a business you need for them to be able to do on the website. And everything else should really be stripped away and, and keep the site as simple as possible. Moving on to that question of identifying which pages need attention. Certainly for a site that's already in production, analytics like Google Analytics can, can give you a lot of that data. So here we've set it to show us the, the slowest pages on the site, and we've got a secondary metric of the actual page views. So that can be really useful because, as an example, the home page is only the third slowest page, but it's definitely the one that gets the most page views, and so that's naturally where we would want to start our investigation. For a site that's still in development, any crawling tool, and in this example we're using Screaming Frog, can give you similar data. You just um, basically use that response rate and, uh, you know, sort that so that it's showing you the, the slowest pages first. And then once we figured out the pages that, that we want to dive into, we need to go in and figure out what are the specific elements and start looking at, in detail, all of the elements and assets that are being loaded um, by that page. And for our purposes, we're going to break that into three different segments. So we've got the page load, the page itself, all of the on-site assets, so the CSS, JS, and images being loaded uh, for that page, and then the third-party assets, or in some cases, they could be tracking pixels or off-site services um, that get called as part of that page load. The tool that I like to use is called Web Page Test. It's uh, very feature-rich and absolutely free. And when you run a test against a URL, it'll give you these nice letter grades at the top that give you sort of a quick sense of, of how well it thinks your site is doing. It gives you some very detailed metrics, not only the, the full page load, but also some steps within that and a couple that are really sort of about the user experience, more the user perception of speed. So things like first paint is when they first uh, go to your URL, how long is it before they start to see, uh, see things draw on the screen? In addition to that data, it gives you this really nice waterfall view of you know, the page call itself, but then all of those different assets that get loaded and, and uh, some of the different um, weights in terms of you know, server connections or first byte times 
as those different assets load. And in, as you can see, this specific example has literally hundreds of different assets that are being loaded for that single uh, web page load. It also gives you this nice connection view. And I like this one because uh, what it does is it basically, for every connection that the uh, browser makes to an individual server, it, uh, it sort of aggregates in line all of the different assets that are loaded. And so it, it gives you a sense of, um, you know, what things are being loaded from, from which domains um, in, a, in a more compact way, which can be really useful. And then finally, if you need all of that really detailed data on those, those individual um, calls, then you can get that too. So coming back to you know, the, the way that we wanted to categorize those, those different calls within our um, page load, uh, certainly the first line is, is our page load. And then we can highlight all of those on-site assets, and then everything that's left is our third party. And this view of things is, is kind of useful to get a sense of the breadth. But uh, for this kind of analysis, actually, the connection view is really nice because um, at a glance, you sort of can quickly get that sense of, of which areas uh, really have uh, potential issues that we want to address. So for example, you know, uh, over two seconds for page load is much too high. Ideally, you'd want to be more around a half a second. Uh, we can see that the on-site assets are contributing almost eight seconds, which again is, is far too high. Um, but really, actually, the biggest issue is probably these third-party assets. And one thing that we see pretty commonly is that um, if you look at any of these, the actual load of the asset itself, that, that narrow little, little sliver, is, is basically insignificant. Um, but the time that it takes the browser to negotiate the SSL connection and wait for that asset to be returned is actually significantly higher than, than the actual download itself. So, that's why a lot of those things, even though if you're looking at it from a data standpoint, it may only be you know, one or two K to, to add a tracking pixel or you know, a couple of K for some JS library, the fact of using all of those different connections aggregates up to really slow down the performance of your site. So now that we've got some data, let's uh, start to analyze it and figure out what are the things that we need to change. So for page load, you know, the first byte is often the key metric, and, and as we talked about, um, we know where to find it on our chart. If we need to do a deeper dive and really understand uh, within that page load um, where we can uh, start to optimize, there are some tools like uh, Site Audit, which is um, in D7 it's a drush command, in D8 it's a module, but it'll spit out this nice report that really gives you uh, a lot of recommendations around how you, you can better configure your site. So things like best practices, it'll talk about how your blocks are set up, uh, caching settings, uh, database health, um, you know, which modules you're using and, and, uh, and so on. So lots of great information there and that's definitely a good starting point. A uh, commercial tool like New Relic is great because it has this historical view. So if you notice that uh, your site is being really slow, you can go into here and see how long that um, you know, uh, speed issue has been, uh, been going on. You can compare you know, this week to last week uh, to get a sense of, you know, um, is it something very recent? Um, and then, you know, potentially it might be something that uh, correlates, let's say, to a recent code deployment. So um, you can also use it to do things like look at um, which modules are um, actually contributing to the, the load time of the site. So in this case, we've got a single uh, custom module that looks like it's probably the single biggest contributor to the, the site load times, and so that's definitely a place where we would want to start uh, to dig in and do more analysis. And even on a particular function call, uh, we can see which functions are contributing uh, most of the load times. So another tool that's great um, for doing that kind of, I'll uh, say, code level analysis is Blackfire, again, a commercial tool. Um, it'll do some of the, the same analysis in terms of telling you which functions are contributing to load times, but uh, the thing that's really nice about this one is it gives you this tree level view, so even within your function, it'll help you to sort of visually map out uh, what's making um, that actual function call take so long. So let's talk about what we can do to improve the page load. Um, if it's the actual, like, the loading of the page itself, uh, which doesn't tend to be the issue, but if that's the case, if you're, let's say, loading a lot of data from an external data source, Try uh, caching that locally and that can help. Or if you're loading a lot of data but only displaying a portion of it, making sure that you're actually pulling the data in a way that's pre-filtered can help. 
Um, if it's just a lot of, uh, let's say, page content, certainly splitting that up can help. Uh, also making sure that your markup is as clean as possible. And if you've got a structure, say, where you've got a ton of content, but some of it is hidden, let's say, within details, elements, or different accordions, then consider if it's possible to load that sum of AJAX through AJAX um, as the user interacts with it. But more typically, what you're going to run into is uh, first byte times, where it's really being slowed down by the complexity of um, what the server has to sort of calculate in order to provide that page to the user. So you can try and, and do some things at the server level. So you can uh, give it more CPU or RAM, which will get expensive. You can make sure you're using uh, latest versions of software, uh, for example, PHP, and having a reverse proxy like Varnish or some uh, server-side caches like APCU or uh, Redis or Memcache will definitely help. Within your... Um, Drupal configuration, making sure that you're leveraging caching as much as possible will definitely be very effective. Um, and then the other thing is if it's, let's say, a view that's um, being really slow to render, uh, you can go into your, your view settings and have it show the, uh, the SQL query that it's actually generating. And then you can either just manually uh, sort of analyze that or you can take that and put that into your like MySQL client with an explain statement in front of it and that'll give you some data around you know, could the actual database uh, potentially be structured better? And it was going through an exercise like that that made me realize that um, in core uh, dates and the date ranges are actually stored as strings, which creates some pretty massive uh, performance issues if you're using those for views. So I made this module called Smart Date that stores them as timestamps. So if you run into that, there's uh, an option for you. Other modules that you might want to use, uh, definitely BigPipe is installed um, by default now in core and that can really help the user experience in the sense that the page doesn't wait for all of the slow elements to render. It'll start, uh, it'll put in placeholders for the slower elements and then render the rest of the page and then dynamically replace those as they become rendered. If it's a site that recently migrated, then um, Fast 404 uh, saves the server from having to bootstrap Drupal for every 404. And using syslog instead of database log will help as just a more efficient way to store any kind of error messages. Uh, to the extent that um, the purge module allows you to, um, to force um, cached content to um, expire automatically, it allows you to set your cache times much longer and that can help with performance as well. And in terms of modules to uninstall, really let's go back to that idea of simplicity. I mean, anything that's only there for you know, window dressing, let's make sure we strip those out and, and not force the server to, to uh, work through more complexity than it needs to. Certainly any development modules, so Devel or Browser Sync or Kint or any of those uh, shouldn't be enabled in production, really ideally not even in the code base. UI modules typically in a production site don't need to be enabled. Um, and the statistics module is notorious as you know, really bulking up the database. And usually, you can get that same information out of Google Analytics anyway. In a similar way, um, the search module that's in core um, puts a lot of uh, extra stress on Drupal in terms of having to, to index that content and provide res results. So if you're using a host like Acquia or Pantheon that has uh, Solar available as um, an external service, that's a, a much more efficient way to, uh, to serve up your search. And PHP filter, in addition to being sort of a giant security hole, um, degrades performance because any content that's using the PHP filter uh, can't be cached. So um, definitely not something that should ever be used in a production site. So next, let, let's talk about those on-site assets. Um, in terms of a metric, the uh, requests and bytes in sort of reflect that, although it tends to be uh, a mixture of that and the third-party assets. Um, but visually, you, you can sort of look at that connection chart and quickly get a sense of how much of an impact that's having on your, your load time. And I'd say this is pretty typical in the sense of images being a major contributor. So if you need to do a deeper dive on those on-site assets because you see that that's where you have an issue, a couple of tools that you can use to get um, even more data would be the uh, Lighthouse audit that's built into Chrome. Um, as you can see, it'll give you insights not only on performance, but on some other areas as well. And it gives you uh, some, uh, some of the same metric metrics, but maybe in a slightly nicer uh, presentation. 
as well as some specific uh, recommendations in terms of uh, not only how it thinks you can improve your site, but even some nice uh, estimations of how much of an impact it thinks it will give you. And if you open one of those up, it'll actually even give you on sort of an asset by asset basis how much of an impact it, it thinks um, you'll get by optimizing those. PageSpeed Insights, another Google product. So um, in terms of the information it's going to give you is pretty similar. The, the main difference here is that it's um, as being read from the Google server. So to the extent that you might be optimizing performance, let's say, for SEO purposes, it's definitely useful to get a sense of how Google perceives the speed of your site. Um, but as you can see, a lot of the same you know, metrics and recommendations are basically the same information. Uh, in terms of optimizing the delivery of those assets, if you're able to use uh, a CDN, that's definitely going to make a major impact. Um, sites like Cloudflare have some inexpensive plans to get started, and there's a CDN module you can use. For your CSS and JS, again, uh, only use what's necessary. If you're using something like Bootstrap, it's really intended to be a starter kit where you strip away what you don't need, but a lot of people dump in the whole thing and then start on top of it. Um, so again, don't try to use everything that's possible. Don't throw in a JavaScript widget to solve every little code problem that you run into. Uh, really try and be judicious about what you're using. The advanced aggregation module uh, can be really powerful in terms of um, helping you to aggregate, compress, and minify sort of your CSS and JS. Um, it'll do things like broadly compression and so on that you won't get out of uh, Drupal uh, 4. And it can also help by doing things like moving render blocking elements to the end of the page so that um, the page starts to render more quickly and, and gives uh, the user that, that perception of speed. In terms of images, uh, definitely you want to use image styles to um, make sure you sort of appropriately size images, actually like resizing them as opposed to like serving giant images and then making them smaller only through CSS. Uh, responsive images, we'll talk about more in a second, um, but really powerful in terms of, um, you know, giving each type of client an appropriately sized image um, in a way that, that can be really sophisticated. Uh, the image optimized module can um, be much more aggressive in terms of not only stripping out sort of metadata and unnecessary information out of your images, but, but actually more aggressively compressing them. And image lazy loader is a really easy way to, to sort of use lazy loading on your site so that only the images that are um, within the user's viewport are actually loading, and, and all of the other ones can dynamically load as, as they scroll down the page. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, responsive images. Um, here we can see demonstrated one of the, the more sophisticated capabilities called Art Direction, where you can actually have different sort of aspect ratios and cropping um, that are optimized for each type of client. But the thing to keep in mind is that that can get complex really fast. So you know this might be a typical set of ranges we use for our CSS in terms of how we're going to optimize our layout. But the thing to keep in mind is that um, even though a single uh, media query would be able to target all of these devices, um, for the sake of working with uh, responsive images, we actually have to pay attention to their actual uh, pixel sizes. Um, and then use the, the different multipliers that correspond between the, the physical resolution and what it um, presents as sort of the device independent pixels. So it can get complex and, and definitely there's a learning curve to working with responsive images. You may find that it's easier to, to keep the aspect ratio to start the same across all different sizes so that you don't have to um, have as many different uh, use cases to worry about. But we'll just quickly talk about the implementation. If you were in the, the theming workshop yesterday, you would have gotten hands-on with some of this. Um, you basically define your breakpoints in your breakpoints.yaml within your theme. And then with, you set up a, um, a responsive image uh, profile, basically. And for all of those different breakpoints and multipliers, uh, you can use different image styles. So you have to set up different image styles. Um, but depending on how complex you go with this, you might end up having to have you know, as few as three or four, but as many as, you know, 12 or 15 different image styles, um, you know, again, depending on how complicated you choose to make this. And then this is what the output looks, looks like within the HTML code. So you've got a picture element that contains a variety of different source sets with the, the different media queries to let the browser know when it should use which one. And then for browsers that don't actually support the picture element, you've got sort of a fallback um, standard image.
So let's move on to the third party assets. And again, really defined by um, that, that giant area and, and all of the different uh, calls within it. Again, we want to try and use as few as possible. Clients tend to like to use you know, every tracking pixel under the sun, but uh, hopefully if they can understand the impact on performance, um, they can sort of rationalize that a little bit. Um, one thing you can do that will help is even if you're using a third party asset to, to cache a local copy of that and serve it off of your own server so that they don't have to make that connection to an external server to be able to use that. And within advanced aggregation, there's this uh, relocator submodule that can automate that and do some of the heavy lifting for you. Um, definitely to the extent that you can use an aggregator like add to any, um, that will save at least the number of connections in the sense of you know, one single connection to retrieve all of your different uh, social sharing buttons instead of having to in individually go out to you know, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and so on. Um, and there are modules for a variety of those different services. So now we've figured out all of the different changes that we want to make. Uh, what are some of the things that we should consider as we get ready to go in and Im implement them? So the main thing is to not do everything all at once. Some of the things that you want to uh, change will work out the way that you thought and make your site faster. Um, some may kind of work, but not as much as you had hoped, and you may need to go in and tweak. And other things may not work, or maybe even you know, uh, work to your detriment. And the problem is that if you do all of those at once and deploy them, you won't really be able to tell which are which. And so it's much better, if you can, to um, do sort of uh, small incremental rollouts, test and measure between so that you understand, did that have the impact that we wanted, uh, should we leave it and build on it, or should we, you know, roll it back and potentially, you know, refine our approach and uh, and try and redo that at a later time. And ideally, what you want to do is to start with what you think will be the quick wins. And a good way to do that is to do this kind of a impact matrix. Take all the changes that uh, you want to make and plot on there how much effort you think it's going to take to implement that um, against how much of an impact you think it'll have on the performance, and then you really want to focus on that magic quadrant of things that you think are going to be high impact and low effort, and start there. So finally, let's talk about uh, what are the things that we should be paying attention to? How can we uh, prevent ourselves from ending up uh, back in the same place of having these performance issues? So certainly whatever you know, uh, dashboards or reporting you're doing um, about the site in general uh, to sort of uh, keep an ongoing uh, picture of its health, should include performance metrics, so average load time and, and what have you. You can uh, leverage CI integration so that as you're pushing code to the site, um, let's say even to your development environment, it'll automatically run performance tests and, and uh, throw warnings if, if there's uh, some kind of performance issue that's being introduced by your code. And then there are modules like uh, monitoring or performance monitor that can help in terms of, you know, again, giving you access to that performance data directly within your, your Drupal admin UI. One thing that, that can be really powerful, especially again in talking with um, you know, either your customer or um, let's say your internal business owner, is this idea of a, a performance budget, which is kind of like a diet plan for your website. So it's saying for each type of asset, let's set a target in terms of how much we're going to use per page, and then uh, we can use that uh, to sort of track you know, where uh, particular pages are slow. Are they you know, adhering to that plan? Are they over? But I think that the most powerful thing about the idea is that it really underscores this idea that if they're going to keep adding new things to the site, they need to either um, take away something equivalent or they're going to be degrading performance. So it really helps to instill that idea as we're, we're having a conversation around adding things to the site is, you know, are we going to give something up or are we going to accept that it's um, you know, going to have a negative impact on performance? And uh, the one limitation, at least of the tools that we're going to talk about, is that they're really about data. And as we talked about before, especially with third-party assets, sometimes it's really that connection bloat that's slowing down the site, and, and that won't really get measured to the same extent. But here's a great little browser-based uh, tool called uh, the Performance Budget Calculator. So you say how set fast you want the site to load, and you can sort of uh, target a typical connection speed. And then it will say how much data that translates into in terms of a, a page size. And you can use these nice sliders to say that's how much uh, we want to allocate to the different types of assets. Um, so just a, sort of a quick and easy visual way you could even do that in the middle of a meeting as a team to sort of try and drive some consensus around that. 
And this is a great uh, browser extension called Browser Calories. Um, once you install that, uh, any page you go to, if you open it up, it gives you this nice format. Kind of looks like the nutritional information on your uh, side of your cereal box. Um, by default, it'll actually compare those different categories against the top 100 websites. But if you have an actual defined um, performance budget, then it, it will give that specifically for uh, against the targets that you've set. Um, but that's a really nice way as you're going through different pages or starting to analyze pages that you've identified as having performance issues um, to give you a nice uh, quick look at uh, you know, some of that different data. So that's actually the uh, content that I brought. Uh, so I'll open it up now for questions or comments. How about organization for uh, single page applications? Um, I mean, I think the same um, basic rules apply. I'd say, I guess the, the challenge there is probably more on the content side. If you've got a lot of content on a single page, obviously that's going to sort of work against you to some degree, but um, typically, you know, if we're talking more about like text type content, um, it's not, that doesn't tend to be like performance wise as much of an issue as long as you're sort of lazy loading and so on, it's, it, it's probably going to be okay. Yeah. yeah. That combined with maybe even caption bar and showing the back. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you talked about like database flow a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Have you had any experience with like revisions in that? Um, specifically with workflows in Drupal 8, I find my revisions tables to occupy like a third of my database or more. Yeah, yeah, that's de that definitely can be an issue. We ran into an issue where um, we were doing. Um, scheduled nightly imports from like a, a product information database and and we ran into exactly that issue. So certainly if there are if you can be selective in terms of only needing the content moderation on specific content types, that can definitely help. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a thing to be aware of and um, yeah. do you know like I know there's like sorry to yeah. uh, um, there's like modules that help you curve revisions. Um, have you had any experience with like writing a plugins or something like that, which purges things based on some... Yeah, so we tried using some of those those modules and never really found any that, that seemed to sort of reliably do what we needed to, so ended up doing kind of something more custom. But yeah, hopefully, <coughs> it's a, a common need, so I'm sure over time there will be some kind of a, of a stable path for doing that, so. Um, so you had a question? I was just going to point out that those modules exist to, to put a job in the Right. <coughs> any other questions? Thanks for that. <laughs>